Let's talk about machine learning model optimization, specifically about model optimization by gradient descent. The basic idea behind this optimization method is to iteratively update a machine learning model such that the overall error model decreases with each update. What better way to update the model to minimize its errors other than going away, avoiding large errors, guided by a negative gradient? That is, in a nutshell, the gradient descent. Every machine learning model aims to take in the model features and match the model target. In reality, almost all machine learning models take in the model features and make model predictions that rarely match the model target exactly. Some error occurs. So the holy grail of machine learning is learning better and better models such that overall model error gets smaller and smaller, ideally as small as possible. Think global minimum kind of low. So let's consider a machine learning model that makes some error. That error depends on the prediction of the model, therefore depends on the machine learning model. Or should we rather say it depends on the machine learning model's parameters, let's call them collectively W, W like in weight. So let's then think of the machine learning model's error as a function of the W, let's call it F of W. When plotting this error function, it can look at either one of the plots shown below here, for a machine learning model with one feature that is to say, or for a machine learning model with two features. It could be that for some model, or should we say for some value of W as an input, we get an error value, maybe the blue dots in the plots below. For another model, or should we say for another value of W as an input, we get another error value, maybe the orange dots in the plots below. Now, some of these error values look smaller than others. For example, the orange dots sit lower than the blue dots. The orange dots actually sit as low as possible. It happens that the orange dots sit at the global minimum of these error functions. We could say then that the orange dots W's are the parameters of our best machine learning models with the lowest possible errors. With this best model out there being the one that generates the lowest possible errors, Machine learning's main problem becomes an optimization problem. Now, if my current machine learning model is not a very good model, say its parameters are one of the blue dots, generating higher errors, how should my model change, or equivalently, how should its parameter change to move closer to, maybe even into, the global minimum position of the orange dots? Now, looking at the one-dimensional a function plot here with the blue dots sitting maybe around w equals 2, you'd say need to move a little bit to the left of 2. Looking at a two-dimensional error function plot with the blue dots sitting maybe around w1 and w2 equals 3, to, uh, 3 and 2, you'd say you need to move a little bit to the left of 3 and a little bit lo lo lower than 2. While it seems so easy to visualize and craft a path towards the minimum for models with these choices of error function in one or two features, things can get more complex as our error function, also known as cost or loss function, so things can get more complex as our error function gets more complicated or as we add more features or dimensions to our models, in which case we lose the luxury of visualizations altogether. So we can only imagine that a similar, simpler rule would help us navigate the blue dots towards the orange dots from whatever worse initial position we start. Something like move a little bit to the left or right in X1 or move a little bit up or down in the second dimension and so on for as many dimensions our models have. Luckily, this simple n-dimensional rule exists, at least for some well-behaved error functions, uh, FWs, for which, given a value position W, the derivative of the function at that position in one dimension, or the so-called partial derivatives of that uh, function at that position in higher dimensional space, exist. It turns out that the collection of all partial derivatives of a function at a given position, basically just a collection of numerical values, right, a vector, is a vector that points in the direction of fastest increase of that function. 
so appropriately call this vector the gradient of the function at that position. Therefore, moving in the direction of a gradient should get us the fastest to the maximum of that function. Now, in machine learning models, machine learning quest is to get the fastest to the minimum of the error function. So the golden machine learning optimization rule would say something like, move in the direction of the negative gradient should get you fastest to the minimum of that function. So let's get some intuition on how this might work for the one-dimensional feature example here. For only one feature model, and therefore one weight, w, if the error function is a quadratic-like function, say 0.6 w squared, think sum of square errors-like functions, the gradient is computed to be 1.2 w, which means that, for example, at w equals 2, the gradient size will be 2.4 with the sign positive sign plus. As the sign of the gradient shows direction of the function increase, pointing to the right, we should move in the opposite direction to the left to decrease the value of the blue error function. Note that if we move all the way 2.4 units to the left, we might go beyond the minimum. So although we know we need to go into the opposite direction of the gradient, we might want to take a smaller step, not the full size of the gradient, but rather a step proportional to the size of the gradient, and control this size step by a parameter. Keep that thought. This tactic will also take care of other scenarios when the error function is, say, less curved up, and the step needs to be larger than the size of the gradient, and so on. Let's look now at uh, w equals 4 and compute a gradient to be as w, uh, plus positive uh, 4.8. Again, the size of the gradient shows direction of the function increase. So if we uh, want to reach to the going lower on the value of the error function, we should move to the left. Again, maybe smaller than the size uh, of the gradient step and rather proportional to the gradient size. Let's also try w equals minus 3, where the gradient is negative 3.6. Now the sign of the gradient is negative, showing the direction of the fu function increase to the left. So we should take a step proportional to the gradient to the right to decrease the value of the error function. Also note that as we go towards the bottom part of the function, the gradients get smaller. The gradient size of 2 is smaller than the gradient size of 3 or the gradient size of 4. And actually, as we go towards the bottom part of the function, the gradient gets smaller and smaller until the function, the gradient gets zero, becomes zero. So the function basically can no longer change, can no longer increase in, or decrease in this scenario. So it reached the minimum. Now, overall, this seems like a good strategy to move in the opposite direction of the gradient for as many times as needed to get to the minimum of that function. So to summarize, this is the so-called gradient descent method that uses gradients to find the minimum of a function iteratively. Specifically, taking steps proportional to the gradient size towards the minimum that is in the opposite direction of the gradient. So the gradient descent algorithm says from any initial point w, presumably not at minimum, right? So the gradient is not zero, move towards the minimum updating the w by small or larger steps in the opposite direction of the gradient. The size of the update is controlled by this step size parameter, also known in machine learning as the learning rate. Now, if the step size is too small, the algorithm might take a long time to converge, reaching the minimum, or might actually never quite reach the global minimum. More complicated scenarios can occur, for example, when the step size is too large. So indeed, in practice, gradient descent is full of surprises, like shown here. If on the left, let's look at the left uh, diagram. If the gradient descent update step size is too large, the algorithm might continually miss the optimal parameter choice, situation known as overshooting the minimum. Or on the right, the algorithm might actually jump from a good global minimum neighborhood, so-called, into a not-so-good local minimum neighborhood, 
It's true. It can also go the other way around, which will be beneficial, right? But basically, a suitable learning rate or a step size, it's hard to come about. Like more other things in the machine learning, treat it as a hyperparameter and start searching for its best value, usually with a validation set or k-fold cross-validation technique. So let's talk about regression models, also known as linear models in machine learning. We will discuss linear regression on logistic regression, see why are they called linear, how are these models learned from the data, and how can we use these models in practice for our machine learning projects. Linear regression is a machine learning linear model that is a machine learning model extracting knowledge from the data while assuming a linear relationship between the features input variable x and the target the single output variable y. More specifically, linear regression assumes that y can be calculated from a linear combination of the input variables x, like this for example. Given a house with known square foot living, we would compute its sales price simply as a multiplier of the square foot living, that is square foot living times a w multiplier plus some bias w zeros. Think of this w zero as some fixed additional charge for buying a house to begin with. The goal of such linear regression is to be later used to predict the sale of the price of any other house given its square foot living. For example, for a house with square foot living of 6,000 square foot, its sale price will simply be uh, W0 plus W1 times 6,000. So an increase of square foot living by one square foot living will increase the price by this W1 dollars. In other words, W1 is how much each foot square living weights towards the price of the house. We therefore call these w zeros, w ones, the weights of the linear regression model. It's linear regression model parameters. Sure enough, we can see how other features of the house might have a say, a weight on the sales price, like maybe the number of bedrooms or the zip code, or except where other features. In which case, the regression equation gets longer, adding more features with their corresponding multipliers or weights. This is traditionally what's called multiple linear regression. Now, using the multiple linear regression equation, basically assuming all other variables stay the same, an increase of square foot living by one square, square foot square will increase the price by W dollars. Or assuming all other variables stay the same, an increase in number of bedrooms by one bedroom will increase the price by this W2 amount of dollars, and so on. We are somehow dancing around these weights, the Ws. What exactly are they? What values, what, what values do they take? We truly need them to actually compute these values, uh, the desired sales price based on these existing features of the house. And here's the key idea behind regression. These weights will be learned from the data. That is to say, the regression equation will be learned from the data. Now let's see how this might work. Let's look at a linear regression with one feature alone for simplicity, easier to visualize and understand the learning mechanism of regression. So as the regression equation in one uh, feature, one dimension alone, it's actually a, a equation of a line. So the regression model here, it's actually the line. So given some data points, x, x, y's, and y, i's, less points shown here again for simplicity, the key idea behind regression is that these data points regress towards a line, the regression line, the regression equation, that can be learned from these data points. As the regression line is defined by its W0, also known as the intercept, and W1, also known as the slope of the line, is the same as saying that the weights W0 and W1, the intercept and the slope that is, will be learned from the data. So how do we learn the regression line, or how do we learn its weights W0 and W1 from the data? Keep in mind that the ultimate goal 
of a good regression model, just like any other machine learning model, is to match the target as close as possible. That is to say here, the best regression line will best fit the given data points, the blue data points here. Geometrically, it basically means that we would like to find a line that is as close as possible to all our blue data points. Say a line draw out of the presentation of this area, the area of this slide, would probably be a bad idea and a bad fit for that reason, so far from all these blue data points with very large errors. And speaking of the errors, the errors are these vertical offsets from each data point yi's to the regression predicted values y hat i's, the model predictions. Now, bringing the line closer to our data points, basically playing around with different choices of the intercept and slope of the line, such that all these choices, all these uh, vertical offsets get smaller, basically would lower the overall sum of all these vertical offsets. That would give us a better regression line with a better fit to the data, to the training data. Also, to give negative errors a chance to meaningful, meaningfully contribute to the overall errors, we traditionally take the sum of squared vertical offsets, not just the vertical offset themselves. And so, we conclude that the best regression line would be the line that minimizes the sum of the square errors, the so famously known as SSE. Or better said, as the regression line is basically described by its W0 and W1 weights, we conclude that the best W1s, W0 and W1 would be those that minimize the sum of square errors. Thus, the way to learn a regression model is to minimize an error function. Minimize an error function, say, with the gradient descent method. Now, multiple regression would work just the same way, no matter how many features we consider. The way to learn a regression model, that's more weights now, is to minimize an error function with the gradient descent method. So let's summarize here the process of learning a linear regression model. It's harder to draw things in Q dimensions here, Q from quantity, but the storyline stays the same. Given data, that's X1 through XQ, as many features as you want to consider, and the output Y, look for a linear relationship between Y and XY, XQ, something like Y equals W0 plus W1, X1 plus W2, X2, and so on. Start with some initial presumably not the best choices of uh, uh, dimensional Q-dimensional regression line, that is to say with some initial choices of all those Ws collected in this the W vector here. Compute the average sum of square error, uh, which is the mean square error, that presumably is large, right? We don't have a very good model to start with. With the intention to leverage gradient descent to move the model into a lower error state, compute the gradient descent of this mean square error with respect to the W, and use the negative gradient with the step size to upgrade or update the uh, W, the model. After a few iterations, we should have a better regression model that's a line that's closer and closer to the given training data point. One more thing here. Let's note that at the end of the day, given some data consistent of features x1, xq, and the output y. The learned li linear regression model is just a collection of w's, is that w vector, some learned numerical values collected, collectively in, collected in this vector w. As many features as we have, as many weights, plus one for the bias. So what we have learned from the data are these weights telling us how the features are connected to influence the output. So when we need to use the train model for predictions on a new data point with each new set of features, all we need to do is to use this weight as multiplier on the feature of the new data point. Now, what if, rather than wanting to know how much this feature of the house weights towards the sales price, maybe we'd like to know 
how much this particular features of the house weighs towards the house being sold or not sold. Um, this would be a classification question, more precisely in this case, a binary classification question. While there are other ways to deal with classification problems, regression was so useful when predicting continuous variables, um, continuous values, and learning the regressor by gradient descent seemed so clever. Can we leverage a regressor to solve a classification problem, like the one we mentioned there, uh, mentioned here with a house problem, or you can think of uh, classifier emails as spam or no spam, uh, doing product reviews, positive or negative product reviews, or any sort of image classification problems. Now, one problem that we can see right away is that the regression output y can take any real values, whereas the output of classification it's either one cross or the other. Think of zero or one. One idea to use uh, to jump from linear regression into a classification solution is, the so is to use the so-called sigmoid or logistic function to squish the values coming out of regression to the zero one range. The output is actually bounded asymptotically between zero and one and depends on the linear model such that when the underlying regression value has value zero, the logistic uh, equation, right, it gives us one plus one over one, that would be like 0.5, providing a natural cutoff point for classification problems. Think of these new values of class probabilities, closer to one, more sure of the class zero, closer to uh, so let's summarize the process of learning a linear regression model by gradient descent. Harder to draw and visualize things in Q dimensions here, but the storyline story line stays the same. Given data features x1 through xq and output y, we look to learn a linear relationship between y and x1, xq, such as y equals w0 plus w1, x1 plus w2, x2, and so on. Start with presumably not the best initial choices of all Ws that is collected here in a W vector. Examine the average sum of square errors, the mean square error, that presumably is large too, right? Not a very good model. Compute the gradient of the mean square error with respect to W and use the negative gradient to update the Ws. After a few iterations, you should have a better regression model that is making predictions closer and closer to the given training data point. One thing to note here, at the end of the day, given some data consisting of features and output and an output value, the learned regression, linear regression model is just a collection of weights, learned numerical values collected into a vector W. When we need to use the train regression model to make predictions on a new data point with these new features, all we need to do is to take these weights as multipliers on the features of the new data point to produce the desired prediction. Now, what if, rather than wanting to know how much this feature of the house weighs towards the sales price, what we, what, what we really care, what we really want to know, it's rather how much this feature of the house weighs towards the house being sold or not. Now, this would be a classification problem or a classification question, more precisely here, a binary classification question. While there are other ways out there to deal with classification problems in machine learning, linear regression was very useful predicting continuous values, and learning the regressor by gradient descent seems so clever. So can we leverage a similar approach to solve a classification problem, like the one we mentioned, or well, there are other plenty uh, binary classification examples, as mentioned below here. One problem that we can see right away with all these scenarios is that the regression output y can take any real value, whereas the output of the classification is either one class or the other, think y equals 0 or y equals 1. One idea to link the regression to classification, so to speak, is to use the so-called sigmoid or logistic function to squish the values coming, from, coming out of the regression to the zero one range and think of these new values of class probabilities closer to zero the values are more sure one class class zero closer to one these values are more sure of the other class class one we are 
to settle things in the middle, we can define a decision boundary at, say, 0.5 to extract class assignments based on this 0, 1 probability ranges. Anything less than 0.5 would assign to class 0. Anything more than 0.5 would assign to class 1. So to summarize, our classifier that leverage regression outputs through the logistic function, it's actually defined by the equation of this equation down here. Sigmoid, or rather should we say logistic, apply to the outputs coming from the regression, the linear regression. And so our classifier here is appropriately called logistic regression. Now a natural question would be, if this is our classifier, how do we learn the best classifier? Would it work just like we did with regression, that is, start with some initial weak classifier, there will be some choices of W, examine the values of those of an error function, and update those Ws using radial descent until we have a better classifier with less errors. Now what would be that error function though? So we need an error or loss function that can be can quantify how close the classifier output probability of class is to the true class, y being 0 and 1. Without going into many details here, the so-called log loss function, also known as binary cross entropy loss, it's a suitable loss function for the logistic regression. So to improve logistic regression model, learning from data, we want to minimize this log loss function. While we're not going to derive the loss log function here, it's not as intuitive as the sum of square errors, we can test whether closer predictions produce lower loss log error values, just to ensure that monitoring and minimizing this log loss function will indeed lead to an overall better model. So as we see from this example here, with a data point x with a true label y equals 1, and two models, say one that predicts the data point probability of class being 0.3, and the other model that predicts the data point probability of class being 0.8, much closer to the true label, right? The log loss error computing for the first model turns out to be, as expected, much higher than the log loss error computing for the second better model. Therefore, better model, better the, uh, lower the log loss error. So, monitoring the mean loss log fun uh, error function would indeed lead to an overall better classifier. Now that we know what we want to minimize, let's see how we find the best logistic regression model leveraging our old friend gradient descent. However, before we summarize learning a logistic regression model by gradient descent, Let's observe that one of the nice properties of both linear and logistic regression is, is that uh, the sum of square error as well as the log loss func uh, error are both convex functions, so we are guaranteed to find a global minimum. So let's summarize the process of learning a logistic regression model by gradient descent. Now you'll see that the process is very similar to uh, the process of linear, learning the linear regression model. Given data features, x1, free xq, and output y, we now look to learn a logistic regression model instead, right? Like y equals sigmoid of w0 plus w1 plus uh, w1x1 plus w2x2 and so on. We start with presumably not the best choices of uh, w's, that's the w's collected in this w vector here, we examine the log loss error that presumably would be large, and we compute the gradient of the loss log error with respect to the W, so to use the negative gradient to update the Ws. After a few iterations again, we should have a much better regression, uh, logistic regression classifier model on hand that is making better and better predictions, class predictions. One thing to note here as well, as with a linear regression model, at the end of the day, the learned logistic regression model, it's also a collection of weights. Now, while the interpretation of weights in logistic regression differs from the interpretation of weights in the linear regression, right, since the weights do not influence the output linearly any longer, still, 
when we need to use the train regression, uh, logistic regression model on a new data point to uh, predict its class, we use the logistic weights as multiplier on the features. We transform the weighted sum with the logistic function as a, to a probability, and then we use a decision boundary to uh, come up with the desired uh, class predictions. Also no worth noting here on both linear and logistic regression, they both could be extended to deal with nonlinear regression or classification problems by just incorporating new features based on the interactions between the features or uh, higher, higher order terms of those features. Let's talk about regularization and how it is used to balance model complexity and model fit with the ultimate goal of ensuring the model generalizes well beyond the training data set. Let's think about the overfitting, underfitting, and the good fit model scenarios in the context of regression models, maybe a nonlinear regression model to go with the graphics here. So for an underfitting model, no much learning from the data is done. The model is usually too simple, might take into account lower features. Maybe some of the features contribute little to the model. So their multipliers or weights are small. Now visually, in the first plot here, we could think of a model simply considering only one of the features, x1, and deciding that anything right of the, va right of the value is one class, anything left of the value is another class, so that's kind of the only learning done from the data. Usually underfitting models don't perform well on the training, and they're not expected and in fact don't perform well on future data sets like validation or tests. Thinking of an, of an underfitting model as a collection of weights, the W vector would be having many zeros, right? Features won't contribute, won't have a voice in the model, or having very small values, features would have uh, much to say, would have a lower voice in deciding the output of the model. Now for an overfitting model, when too much learning from the data is done, the model is usually too complex, might take into account more features and beyond, maybe incorporating some complex interactions between features, combination of more than one features, uh, with most features having a strong voice uh, waiting towards the uh, outcome of the model. Uh, visually, we can look at the second plot here, where every feature is drawing attention to individual data points, dragging and pulling the uh, decision boundary, in this case the model, one way or the other to accommodate all the, all the details in the data, all the noise in the data, I would say. Now, such models will perform well on the training data set, learning every detail and noise is there to be learned, to the extent that it might impact, negatively impact, the performance on future data sets like validation or, or training or test data sets. So these models won't generalize well. They will merely memorize the training data. Now thinking of an overfitting model from a perspective of collection of weights, uh, the W vector will be larger in size and have larger elements, larger values. With this perspective, that the underfitting models will be like the vector W will be larger in size or large values, nevertheless giving you the best fit. And the underfitting models being uh, the vector W being smaller in size, smaller values, many, many zeros, nevertheless giving you the best complexity, if we think simpler the better. We can envision a good fit or so-called uh, regular model being a compromise model between, right, a compromise between fit and complexity, having the weights vector somewhere in between a size and length go, not too many features, not too few, and not too small, and not too large weights. Would it be nice to be given a slider to find that sweet spot, that right balance between complexity and fit? They would give us the best model that performs well on training, as well as on validations or test sets. Such a miraculous slider exists. Uh, it's called a regularizer. 
So here enters regularization, which is a machine learning technique that helps overfitting and underfitting models adjust to be more useful on training and both training and validation sets. Most of the time, regularization is actually used to control overfitting by penalizing large weights, sometimes reducing them all the way to zero, in which case the corresponding features will be basically dropped out of the model. So let's see how regularization accomplishes the, accomplish this, penalizing this large weight. Let's first remember how these weights were, were being learned to begin with, so large, right? By minimizing an error function, the C of W here with respect to W. By minimizing this error function with respect to W, aiming for the best fit of the model. It kind of makes sense to think that aiming for, you know, minimizing the best complexity of the model, some complexity function would be also minimized with respect to W. And that function is traditionally called in machine learning a penalty function. You penalize the model for being too complex. And so, to regularize a machine learning model, it's basically minimizing this extended error cost function, we call it cost regularize function, still minimizing the original error, right, the CFW, at the same time with minimizing the complexity of the model for a simple model. Note that uh, this regularizer parameter alpha, you know, it can be used to calibrate or control the strength of the regularization that you apply on the model. Like if, uh, if for example, alpha is zero, there's no penalty for complexity applied, and therefore the model will concentrate on the best fit, most probably producing overfit models. If alpha value is too big, then the penalty on complexity will be very strong leading to presumably very simple models, right? They will be like underfitting models. Now, it's hard to know what the best value of alpha would be for your data or your model. So treat alpha as a hyperparameter and select the best value by using a validation set or a k-fold cross-validation technique. Now, we kind of know what the error function might look like for a linear or logistic regression, the sum of square error or the log loss function. How about this penalty function? Two popular uh, penalties or regularization procedures out there are the reach regression, also known as the L2 regularization. This one is a popular regularization choice, basically penalizing the model by minimizing the sum of squared values of all features weights. Uh, we'll try or this technique it's actually trying to uniformly make all the weights smaller but not necessarily driving them to zero whereas the last saw regression or also known as the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator also known as the L1 regularization many names it's penalizing the sum of the absolute value of all features weights shrinking some of the weights all the way to zero due to the uh, L1 uh, geometry, uh, the, the geometry of the L1 norm. So if the weights are learned to be zero, that means the corresponding features will be deemed unnecessary to the model, so they are basically dropped uh, from the model. And uh, therefore, the L1 regularization performs feature selection. This is particularly useful or essential to have, an essential tool to have, when the dimensionality of your model uh, gets out of hand by, say, feature engineering. There's also a combination of these two, uh, both techniques. It's called elastic net, and it's basically applying both penalties, uh, with a, usually with the effect of a compromise between the two. And last, by, by no means least, as with any other metric-based uh, procedures out there to avoid any scaling issues please remember to scale your features before applying regularization now that we know some techniques to learn the coefficients for a linear or logistic regression model and how to adjust overfitting and underfitting models let's see how we can use regression models in practice with uh, sklearn there are a few linear regression implementations in sklearn one of them with no regularization that is a linear regression it basically fits a linear regression model by computing a 
uh, the solution to the regression model by a matrix formula and runs into issues when features are highly correlated, producing large variance in results. Uh, rich regression addresses some of the problems of linear regression by imposing an L2 penalty. Please note the regularization is applied by default, right? Alpha is set at 1 by default. And uh, as alpha goes larger, the amount of regularization increases. As the large uh, alpha goes low, uh, you play around with uh, lower values of alpha, the regularization is weaker. Uh, rich regression also uh, rich regression also has an implementation uh, with built-in cross-validation, right? Rich CV. If you'd rather use an L1 penalty to maybe do feature selection, uh, the scikit-learn has a lasso and lasso CV implementation also available. As for the logistic regression, right, uh, a method, a machine learning model that's actually doing classification, remember that. Uh, there are two implementations, Logistic Regression and Logistic Regression CV, uh, with a built-in cross-validation. Uh, all regularization is done here as well, right? Uh, they don't, you can choose the type of regularization by playing around with the penalty parameter. You can choose L1, L2, or Elastic Net. Note that the regularization is also applied by default here, and they are using a slightly different regularizer parameter. Uh, this one is attached to the cost function, not to the penalty, so it's called, uh, it's titled C. And it's basically the uh, inverse of the alpha. Uh, keep in mind that larger the value of C, lower the amount of regularization you apply on your model would be.